Okay, now, uh, so first of all, I've simply postulated, I've just postulated this momentum, um, and, uh, and there are derivations. You can find derivations. I say a little bit about it in the notes, and you can find them in, in many books on special relativity. The derivations are not very illuminating because they rely on a sophisticated understanding of special relativity. So let's just treat this as a postulate that this object would be a four vector. Well, what do I mean when I say that an object is a four vector? When I say that an object is a four vector, what I mean is that its components transform according to the Lorentz transformation. Okay, this is a very important point. What does it mean to say that if you say P is a four vector? Well, whenever you say something is a vector, forget about the four. When we've used vectors in the past, we've used scalars and we've used vectors. When we say that we have scalars and vectors, we're saying something about the transformation properties of those objects. So when we say something is a, is a vector, we're saying that if we rotate the coordinate systems system, it'll maintain its length. We say that if we have two of them and we dot product those two vectors together, we will get a scalar that, again, doesn't depend on coordinate system and so on. It, it, it's about geometric transformation and multiplication and addition type properties. It's mathematical properties. In fact, they're the kind of rules of linear algebra. There's a, there are rules of linear algebra for vectors. And similarly, there's rules of linear algebra for these four vectors. The most important rule for these four vectors is that this statement, P is a four vector, is completely identical to the statement, the components of P transform by the Lorentz transformation. Okay, these two statements are identical. So I'm going to postulate this four vector. We're going to imagine that it is a four vector. We're going to imagine that its components transform according to the Lorentz transformation. And if that's true, then the geometric properties of this four vector are the same as the geometric properties of the space-time separations like that vector A that I drew in the first, uh, in the, on the previous board. Um, and so there'll be this shear property of it. And it also means that there'll be an, an analogy to the conservation of space-time interval. So let's look at that question, uh, and then we will uh, do some problems. Okay, so here is my four vector. Now I'm going to... Um, I'm going to look at the conservation or the invariant properties of it. Okay, so here we go. Okay, there we go. So I've postulated that there's this this uh, four vector which looks like e p x p y pz, or if you prefer, it looks like gamma mc. Whoops, I can't quite call this e. I've made a mistake. In fact, on the previous board, I made a slight mistake. Why can this not be e here in the vector? Oh, I can hear somebody saying it. It's that it's dimensionally incorrect. The dimensions of momentum are different from the dimensions of energy. So what I'd written down before was dimensionally incorrect. The different dimensions of this vector have to be the same, so it should be this. And I said that gamma mc, I said that I'd said that gamma mc was the energy, but of course it's not the energy. Gamma mc squared is the energy, because it's mc squared. So I had an error on the board a few seconds ago. So now uh, this is correct. It's e over c, which is gamma mc, and then gamma mvx, gamma mvy, this is now going to go off the edge of your screen, mvz, blah, blah, blah. Okay, good. Um, 
Now, if this is a four vector and therefore it transforms according to the Lorentz transformation, the Lorentz transformation, as you've seen in the book and in presentation, conserves this thing called the interval, which in the case of a space-time displacement was delta t squared minus delta x squared minus delta y squared minus delta z squared. So here, the conserved quantity, or the invariant, there's going to be an invariant for the four momentum, which I'm going to draw suggestively like this. I'm going to draw it as the absolute value of p squared. That's a very strange thing to call it because it's not the same as the magnitude of a three vector, but it plays the same role as the magnitude, so we use the same notation for it. But if you want, you could put a little rel here to remind yourself that this is the relativistic magnitude we're talking about, not some thing you're more used to. This is going to be defined to be the time component squared minus the space component squared, just like the interval was the time squared minus the position squared. So this will be e squared over c squared minus px squared minus py squared minus pz squared. Okay, now this, I want to now manipulate this a little bit. So this, because we'll learn, we'll learn something by manipulating this. First of all, this here, you'll notice, is just the negative of the magnitude of the momentum. The momentum, the three momentum, the three vector momentum is px, py, B, pz, and its magnitude is px squared plus py squared plus pz squared. So we can write this magnitude or this invariant as e squared over c squared minus p squared, where this is now the magnitude of the three vector momentum, which I'm drawing here as boldface because I want to distinguish our four vectors from our three vectors. So here's a three vector momentum squared, and if we subtract it off from the energy with the unit set right squared, we get this invariant. Okay, but let's let's now plug in uh, things we know for these energies. So this energy here is gamma m c. This e over c is gamma m c. So this is gamma m c squared here, and this p, of course, is gamma m v. Squared, where again, I've taken the magnitude of the three vector velocity squared. And if it's true that p is a four vector, then it transforms by the Lorentz transformation, then this thing, this thing here, is a frame independent quantity. So that's, this might, that might be like, oh yeah, whatever, that, who cares? But remember, it, this, is a, this is a surprising thing to be able to take a momentum and make a frame-independent quantity. Because remember, momentum is not frame-independent. Three momentum is not frame-independent. After all, if you have a bullet flying through the room, it has a lot of momentum. But if you're running through the room as fast as the bullet, relative to you, it has no momentum. So... The momentum is something, the three momentum that we're used to using, in fact, is a frame-dependent uh, quantity. Even its magnitude is a frame-dependent quantity. It's zero in some frames. It's large in other frames. So this is not a frame-dependent, not a frame-independent quantity. It's a frame-dependent quantity. And E over C is also a frame-dependent frame quantity because, again, in the frame in which the bullet flies through, it has a lot of uh, kinetic energy and in the frame in which you're running alongside it, it has no kinetic energy. And so th both of these are frame-dependent objects, and the, the postulate is that if these are components of a four-vector, which transforms by the Lorentz transformation, then this combination of them must be a frame-independent quantity. Okay, now we're going to do some math to check that,
by expanding this. So I wrote this out with the formula for it. I wrote this out with the formula for that. And notice we have a lot of postulates here. We've built up a lot of postulates. We've postulated this four momentum here. We've postulated that this energy is given by this. And we've postulated that the momentum is given by that. So there's a lot of postulates here. Those postulates can be justified, but they're much easier to justify after you understand special relativity. So I think it's better to just think of them as postulates. We'll proceed and see what we conclude from those postulates. Okay, so let's complete that and then we will get on to doing some problems. <laughs>